Welcome everyone. My name is Frank Longobardi. I'm Transformation Manager here at Staples Canada. And I wanna thank you all for attending the Spotlight session, Create a Healthy Productive Home Office. For those of you who are new to Spotlight, Spotlight is both a physical and virtual destination in which we like to bring together like-minded people like yourselves. <clears throat> Our goal is really to provide rich content that can support you to reach your own personal goals and ambitions. And today I have a, the great pleasure of introducing Dr. Andrew Salatiski. Dr. Andrew has worked in uh, the health and fitness field for about 20 years and has been uh, providing ergonomic assessments and consultations since 1988. He is the clinical director of total rehabilitation and clinic uh, center with two locations in Thornhill and Richmond Hill. Dr. Andrew is a chiropractor, a clinical acupuncturist, registered geologist, a clinical exercise physiologist as well. So thank you, Dr. Andrew, for leading this uh, session. If anyone has any questions at any point in the session, we'd be more than happy to take your questions throughout. All you need to do is raise your virtual hand or uh, put your questions in chat and we'll uh, take the questions throughout. There will be a Q&A period after, at the end of the session, so we'll be able to take care of that about three o'clock or so. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Andrew. Thanks very much, Frank. And uh, it's a privilege to be speaking to all of you out there. And uh, I'm excited to present on behalf of Staples and Fellows again. Um, so before we get started, I just want to tell a little quick story. Um, when the pandemic hit and we had the big uh, shutdown in March, um, my clinics were both shut down and we transitioned to online virtual consults. And within, I'd say, two to three weeks of people working from home, Lo and behold, we started getting all these calls with people coming in, asking, you know, saying that they're having aches and pains from spending their, their days at home working on their laptops. And now that, and I was probably at least 80% of what we were seeing. And now that we're back in clinic, that is still probably the majority of what we see from people who are working from home. And hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll get a better understanding of how you're set up at work, uh, specifically at home, how that directly affects uh, your health and well-being and how your body feels. And hopefully by the end of this, you should get some good ideas on how to set yourself up in a better position so that you will be more comfortable and more productive at home so you don't have to come see someone like me. So this is the current trend. Uh, social distancing, uh, mask wearing is here. Um, it's something that we're probably still going to be doing for quite a while. And the other thing that's happened, a lot of businesses that were reluctant to work from home are now realizing that their employees can still get a lot of work done. And I know a, new, a lot of businesses that are actually looking at decreasing their office space and having their customers work from home and their staff work from home. The problem with that is that typically one, um, we're not in a set space when we're at home. We don't always have a dedicated workspace. And if you look at the pictures on the right-hand side, I've probably hit numerous ones of those positions while I've been working from home. Uh, we're gonna have a little poll asking you which position looks most familiar to you. And one of the big issues with you know, these different positions is that um, you know, we're, the equipment we have typically isn't designed um, for ergonomics. It's designed just for comfort and not designed for long-term use um, at home. And when we have our, you know, companies invest heavily in ergonomics and in proper workstations, but uh, unfortunately that usually doesn't translate when, when we work from home. So when I look at the poll here, uh, we're going between B and E which is at the desk, which is great. But uh, the problem with being at the desk like that is still a lot of times you don't have the right equipment, specifically if you're on a laptop and your body's going to adapt to some awkward postures. So looking at this next slide here, um, there's a couple of key things we wanna consider when we think about setting up our workspace from home. And first of all, your workspace and how you're set up is really just gonna dictate how your body feels. So if you know, you're working from your bedroom on your bed or on the, dining, on the living room floor at a coffee table, those things and how your body is positioned will directly affect uh, what, your, what muscles are activated, how much tension is being put on the body and will directly affect you know, what's gonna start aching on you. Okay, we wanna look at our posture specifically and avoid these awkward postures. Um, if you look at the top left-hand picture there, you know, she's sitting at the edge of the bed, 
And the problem is, is that her back muscles aren't supported and her back's not supported. So those muscles are engaged for, you know, if she's there for a couple hours for a long period of time, okay, without moving. And it's not a heavy contraction, but over time that's gonna to lead to fatigue and put excessive strain on the joints and discs of the spine. And then if we look at the bottom left-hand picture, um, you know, she's working on the floor there and her hands rubbing up against the edge of the coffee table, okay, which is putting an excessive pressure and strain on the wrist. And particularly at that point in the wrist, the uh, median nerve goes through there, which uh, can affect, you know, the carpal tunnel when people hear about carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, and that can cause sometimes numbness or tingling or just pain in the wrist as well. So what we really want to focus on doing is getting into a more neutral and relaxed posture where a lot of these muscles aren't engaged, okay, and there's less strain on the body. And then the, the last thing we really want to think about is taking breaks. Um, as human beings, we're designed to move. We are not designed to sit all day, and that really has become the bane of our modern existence. There we go. So talking about this, how your workspace and how you're set up, how that's going to dictate how you feel, there's two key things that your body is going to do when you sit down to work. Okay. And your body is going to adapt to where your hands are and then where your eyes are. So if you look at the top picture on the left, you know, she's turned and twisted a bit because she's writing in her notepad. Okay. So her body's going to twist and adapt to that. And then if you look at the bottom left-hand picture there, that gentleman, he's sitting at a desk um, looking at his monitor, but from an ergonomic perspective, that monitor is too low. And what happens there is that even if he tries to sit upright in a great posture, he's going to be looking at that screen. So his eyes and his body is going to come down to adapt to look at that screen. Okay. So what's happening in that, that previous picture there is that he is adapting his body to fit how that workspace, workspace is set up. And we want to flip that around and adapt the workspace to fit him. Okay, so once again, these awkward postures. In these postures, you know, you have muscles that are engaged that don't need to be engaged. Okay, so they're going to be contracting for long periods of time. And, you know, it's like I said before, it's not a heavy contraction, but eventually with time, those muscles are gonna fatigue and that's gonna put strain on the joints and the nerves in that area, okay? And then we talk about contact stress. Um, even looking at the top left-hand slide, besides the pressure on the arm, um, she's sitting with her knees up, which put, puts a lot of pressure on her bum and the sciatic nerve goes basically down behind uh, your, your bum. And for anyone who's had sciatic issues, they know that, you know that sitting on a hard surface over time can really lead to a lot of issues. So there's two key things we want to do to get ourselves into a better posture and a more optimal posture. Okay. And first of all, we, we talk about getting into this neutral and relaxed posture. Okay. And that's a position where back muscle where muscles simply aren't engaged as much. Okay. And your body is being supported. Um, the way I, I like to put this is if, you know, if you were to go for a long drive and go for a three, four hour drive, or you're going to sit back and watch a movie, what do you do? You sit back and you relax on the couch, right? Um, you get into your car, you sit back into the car. Okay. But when we sit down to work, a lot of times we just get down to work. We sit in our chair, we don't adapt anything. And then we just type away and start working on our laptop. Okay. So what we want to do is first get ourselves into the best relaxed posture we can. And then from there, we want to adapt everything at our workspace to fit us. And that's all ergonomics is in, in a nutshell, is products or devices that are designed to fit the end user in a neutral and relaxed posture. So we want to think about getting ourselves relaxed and then modifying everything to fit us as opposed to us adapting to how our workspace is set up. Okay. Now, uh, if there's one thing I can impart with you today is that we need to take breaks. We are designed to move. Um, you know, the more we move, the more the circu our circulation flows throughout our body, the more you circulate the synovial fluid in your joints to take pressure off the joints. Okay. And um, a good rule of thumb is we, we call this the 20-20-20 rule. Okay, and basically every 20 minutes or so, you wanna get up and take a little micro break and a 20 second break. So you don't have to get up and you know jog around the block or anything like that, but get up 
and, and move a little bit. So, um, you know, if you have tension between the shoulder blades, stop, get up, roll the shoulders back, you know, do a few stretches. Uh, if you have strain on the low back, um, you know, you can lean forward in your chair, bend forward, stand up, do some twists, anything you can do to get your body moving. Uh, there's numerous research now that people who spend more than six to eight hours sitting at work a day are at higher risk of type two diabetes, uh, more severe um, issues with cardiovascular disease. There was a study that just came out showing that the risk of uh, colon cancer is higher in people who sit. So if there's one thing I can tell you is we want to get up and we want to move. The final piece of that 2020 rule is that um, since you know the invent, uh, invention of our smartphones, um, our viewing distance has really been shortened. So we're spending a lot of time now looking at our laptops really close, looking at our devices hunched down like this at a really close distance. And since I think it was 2008 when the smartphones, uh, the first iPhone came out, um, we they've seen a huge increase in the incidence of people needing reading glasses or even having issues with uh, nearsightedness um, because we're spending so much time looking at devices so close. So what we wanna do is when you take that 20 second break, if you have a window to look out of, change that viewing distance, look out the window, okay? So stretch, open up, look out the window. Um, if you don't just turn, look at things at a different distance just to give your eyes a break as well, okay? so. Really simple, but it's amazing how, you know, I've done it myself. We sit down on our laptop and next thing you know, three hours, four hours have gone by and you haven't moved at all. So really make uh, the effort to take those breaks. And if you're having a lot of aches and pains from working from home, actually set a timer. There's a numerous apps you can download called break timers that will um, do this for you and just give you a quick reminder. Some of them even show some exercises to do. Highly, highly recommend. Okay, so now we're going to get a little bit more into the actual nitty gritty of setting up your workspace. Okay, and there's four key things you want to address. First, you want to optimize your seating, and that's really going to affect what's happening with your low back and your legs. Okay, you're next you're going to look at your wrist and hand position, uh, and that's going to affect what's obviously happening with the wrists and the arms, but also up, up into the shoulder blades as well. Your monitor and document placement is really going to affect what your head does. So if you tend to have neck tension or headaches, you want to really focus on that. And then the final thing is just your desktop layout, um, where you just want to look at being as efficient as possible with how you're set up. Okay. So when I look at this list here, um, this is probably, you know, the top eight of the things I see at my office now and my massage therapists and physiotherapists see at the clinic. Uh, and all of these things at some point can be directly related to how you're feeling, okay? Uh, how you're feeling from working from home and how you're set up at home. So I think we have another poll again uh, where people can go through and um, just list what you feel is your main issue that or ten, that's what tends to bother you the most from working from home. Okay, so we've got a lot of stiffness coming up, uh, pain between the shoulder blades and headache as well. Okay, yeah, stiffness, huge, huge thing here. Right now that's in the lead. Um, with stiffness, that's uh, incorporating motion is probably the number one thing you can do. Getting yourself into a better position so your muscles aren't engaged, because when your muscles are constantly contracted for a long period of time, that's gonna increase your stiffness. So getting into that neutral posture Okay, which we're going to show you how to do, and then incorporating some movement as well. So if we look at that, yeah, the number one thing is stiffness, but then pain between the shoulder blades and headache are right up there as well. And I'm going to show you how your monitor position and how you're mousing and typing are directly related to those issues. Okay. Oops, back here. Okay, so seating. Um, now, like I talked about with equipment, a lot of a lot of us don't have the dedicated task chairs that uh, we have at work. So you see, um, a lot of people are sitting on, you know, the chair we have in the middle there, a wooden dining room chair, which um, is not ideal, obviously. So the first thing I'm going to say is, if you know that for the next six months to a year you're going to be working from home, it 
it is recommended to get a task chair uh, or an ergonomic chair that is able to adapt to you. Okay. Um, if you don't, there's tweaks we can make with a basic chair like this, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you're really going to be spending a lot of time, uh, spend a bit of money and invest in you know one of these chairs that at least can at least go up and down uh, and give you some lumbar support as well. Okay. So the couple of th things we look at. Number one thing is the height of the chair. Okay. And when you're sitting, ideally, your thighs want to be parallel with the floor and your feet want to be flat on the floor. Um, I'm about almost six foot eight, so a lot of chairs don't go up high enough for me. So I need to usually put a cushion um, to get my feet so that my feet are still able to go flat on the floor. For people who are shorter, we have the opposite issue that people sit and their legs are dangling. So in a case like that, you know, getting some type of support for your feet is key. Okay, uh, we look at the seat pan depth as well. So that's this distance from the back of the chair to the front of the chair. Um, if you're shorter, what tends to happen is you try to sit back, but your, your bum is still a, a ways from the, the back of the chair. So you tend to round your spine to fill in that space. That's where getting some type of cushion and putting that up on the seat back makes, makes a big difference. And then back support, okay? Um, the whole point of your chair back is to support your spine. Okay, um, when we get on the laptop, we tend to hunch forward and then our muscles are engaged, which ideally is not optimal. So when we look at that, things like your bed or your stool or, you know, uh, a kitchen stool are not ideal. Um, both from one, you just simply don't have a lot of support. Okay, so your muscles are gonna be engaged for long periods of time. And on something like a stool that puts a, a lot of pressure right, you know, at at the base of your seat, which um, can lead to issues as well. And a lot of times some uneven pressure between one side of the bum cheek to the other, which can lead to issues with pressure on the spine. So we want to look at some basic solutions. Okay, so once again, if my feet are dangling, we look at something like a footrest or even at home, some books, some boxes to put your feet up on. So you can still keep your thighs in that parallel position, but then have your feet supported. Okay, um, with the chair back, okay, if that chair back is really far away, that's where taking a cushion, okay, or rolling up a bath towel, or looking at an actual professional office support can come into play uh, to give you some support through the lumbar spine. And as we go through this in a little bit, we actually have a video showing how to set these things up for you using everyday household products. So if you're kind of trying to picture it in your head, I will, sh we will show you in a few minutes here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what happens with typing and mousing to our wrist and our hand, okay? Um, we're gonna go through a super quick anatomy lesson here. And why this is important is this is gonna show you how your wrist position can directly affect uh, you know, the nerves in your, in your hand specifically. So looking at this picture here, um, it's a cross section of my wrist cut right about there, out like this. Okay, so those white guys at the bottom, those are the carpal bones. And you have a whole bunch of bones in your wrist that basically allow you to flex and move with all this freedom, which is fantastic. Okay, the problem is that just above them and through them here, you have this little ligament that goes across called the transverse carpal ligament. So that space between the ligament and the bones is called your carpal tunnel. And in there goes all the little blue things you see there. And those blue things are the tendons that allow your fingers to move to flex, okay? And your wrist to flex as well. So every time I click my mouse or type on my keyboard, I have a tendon sliding up and down through that carpal tunnel. And the issue is, um, like I said, I'm about six foot eight and this my carpal tunnel is probably maybe a centimeter by centimeter in space if that so it's a really tiny space now the other thing that goes through the carpal tunnel is the yellow guy you see in the picture here that's the median nerve so the median nerve goes to the thumb index finger your, uh, middle finger and half your ring finger um, so a true carpal tunnel is where the nerve starts getting compressed, starts getting irritated, okay, and starts causing numbness, tingling into the thumb and the index finger, um, and then also weakness as well. So people start dropping things and having to shake their hand out because it's, it's getting numb all the time. Now the nerve has a little coating on it that helps uh, prevent friction, but over time that gets inflamed, okay? And when we do therapy, we try to deal with that inflammation. Um, 
In severe cases, they do surgery where they cut that transverse ligament and just open the whole space up. The problem is you still have about a 10 to 15% recurrence rate after surgery. And, and I think that is directly late related to the fact that people feel better. So they go back to work and they get into these awkward postures that lead to problems. And now we're gonna go through a little demo of how your wrist position can affect this. Okay, so the neutral position for your wrist is straight, nice and flat, okay? So I'm gonna get you guys to try to do this at home just to demo this. Okay, so what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your right hand and you're gonna put it nice and straight like this, nice and flat. Now take your left hand and take three fingers and you're gonna give it a tight squeeze, okay? So you should feel that you have a pretty good amount of force production there and maybe a tiny bit of pressure through there. Now what I'd like you to do is take your wrist back and give a squeeze, okay? Or flex your wrist forward and give a squeeze. So in both of those positions, you're losing about 10 to 15% of your force conduction, okay? So if you're clicking a mouse, you're not as efficient, but then if you do this or do this, you're gonna feel more pressure through the carpal tunnel. So what do we do when someone has carpal tunnel syndrome? We, a lot of times we put them in a brace that keeps the wrist flat, okay? So your wrist position, okay, if you're reaching down to type on your keyboard or you're reaching up on a table is going to directly affect and could directly impact the carpal tunnel. Okay, so if you're getting any numbness or tingling in your hands, really be conscious of that neutral position. The next thing we look at in the middle picture here is contact stress. So if your hand's rubbing up against the edge of your desk, okay, or the edge of the laptop, that is gonna affect, you know, wrist pain and carpal, the carpal tunnel as well. And then the last thing we look at is this wrist deviation. Uh, that's not as much of an issue. That actually tends to affect what happens in the elbow. So if you have either say golfer's elbow or tennis elbow, you wanna look at your wrist position there. But the number one thing you wanna do is keep your wrist neutral. Okay, let's go. So good example here, the top picture on the left there, uh, you know, reaching down. If you're too high and you're reaching down like that, that's gonna put that wrist into extension, put a little bit more pressure and you're just not gonna be as efficient, okay? The other thing, um, you know, solutions, a lot of times people get these gel pads and wrist pads. And the main reason I use them when I do an assessment is not to cushion the wrist, but because if you think about it, if this is irritating, you put even more pressure there, sometimes that can cause more problems. But the main thing, why I use uh, gel pads at some sometimes with some patients is to get them into that neutral posture. Okay, so if you're having issues with this at home, things you can look at are the dedicated gel pads. Okay, but even taking a little tea towel or face cloth and rubbing it up, if you're rolling it up and putting it under the wrist there and supporting right by the palm, if you find when you're hey when I'm set up my wrist is extended or flexed a little bit as well. Okay, so um, if we look here, we're gonna talk about monitor position, but there's one other little demo I wanna go through with you uh, talking about your keyboard position, okay? Um, if your you know, table's too high, whoops, sorry, let's go back. One sec here. So if your table is too high and you're reaching forward, so I'm typing, and I'm reaching forward like this, okay? Another thing is gonna happen. So what I want you to do is at home, uh, take your left hand and just put it on top of your shoulder here, just right beside your neck, okay? So now have your arm just hanging, hanging by your side there, okay? So a lot of people will still have tension. This is where we get a lot of patients with tension, okay? But now what I want you to do is bring your arm out to the side, okay? Or just bring it forward. Now what happens there? You can feel that muscle contracts, right? Okay, so even if your hand is supported and resting on a desktop, that muscle is going to contract. Okay, and the issue with that muscle is that muscle doesn't just go here, it goes from here all the way up to the base of my neck. Okay, that's part of the upper trapezius. And you know, so I get a lot of patients who you know they have tension through here, but they're reaching forward and mousing, and then that leads to neck pain and also that kind of people who get the headaches kind of at the base of the skull there as well. Okay, so really being focused. And if you look at the picture in front of us now, um, the gentleman, he's in actually a really good neutral posture. So he's in slightly back, leaning against the chair there. Okay, so his back is being supported. His muscles don't have to engage. 
His arms are down by his side, which is what you want. Elbows are roughly at 90 degrees. You can see his wrists are neutral, okay? His legs and thighs are parallel, and then his feet are supported by the foot support, which is fantastic, okay? Now let's talk about monitor position. Uh, when I do assessments and go into companies, uh, this is probably one of the uh, biggest areas I see where people um, aren't set up correctly, okay? So when you're sitting in front of your monitor and you look straight ahead, you wanna be hitting the top third of the monitor, okay? So when you look and draw a line from this gentleman's eyes here going straight out, uh, you should be hitting roughly that top third of the monitor. Um, so if you're on a laptop, that is literally impossible, okay? So no matter how you're set up, you know, you can be and be conscious of your position. If you're looking down at a laptop over time, you're gonna pull yourself forward. It's as simple as that. There's no way to avoid that, okay? So we look at the next picture here, laptop users, you are looking down, okay? Um, if you are just doing an email and you gotta, you know, uh, do a few things and type up a couple things and you're gonna spend an hour or so, it's fine to be on a laptop for a bit. But if you're spending five, six hours a day working from home on a laptop, I guarantee you it's gonna to lead to issues. So in that case, you need to look at bringing your laptop up and putting it up on something and rising it up. Um, numerous ways you can do this. You can use boxes, reams of paper, um, or you can look at actual designated laptop risers to bring the monitor up. But if you do that, you can't be typing with the keyboard like that. So you have to invest in a separate keyboard and mouse. But, you know, in terms of cost, you can get a good wireless keyboard and mouse for probably, you know, under 30, 40 bucks nowadays. Um, and then just put some boxes underneath your laptop. You're going to be in a much, much better position. Okay. And if we look at the picture on the right, so this gentleman does have a separate monitor, but that monitor is too low. So even with him hunched forward like this, he's looking over top of the monitor. Okay. So he needs to be hitting that top third. So he should get ideally in a better chair, I would say, get back into the chair. Um, and then from there, adjust the monitor to get to the right height. And once again, that can be stacks of paper, boxes, you name it, or you can look at monitor arms or risers, um, you know, if you're going to be spending a lot of time working from home. Okay, so document placement is also an issue, okay? So you can be in the ideal perfect posture, but then if you're constantly looking at papers and looking down you know, to the right or to the left, that's gonna lead to issues, okay? Um, so really simple solution. You just wanna get some type, of lap, um, some type of document holder to put those papers up. So I'm looking at my screen and then the documents are just up like that. Now, uh, one thing we don't have a slide for, but it's something we're seeing more and more, even from home, is people working with uh, dual monitors. So that's something I just want to touch on briefly here as well, too. Okay. Um, with the dual monitors, okay, uh, two big, big issues with that is that they, our monitors now tend to be quite wide. So you could have two monitors set up and you're literally, um, you know, looking at a meter across sometimes. Okay, which is a lot to look at. And what tends to happen is people still tend to look at one monitor than the other. And sometimes they'll spend half their day with a slight tilt in their neck. Okay, so ideally, you basically put the monitors in a slight V, okay, with the middle of the two monitor, the, the, uh, the edge of both monitors in a V roughly in line with your nose. However, um, there is something called your dominant eye which um, just like neurologically, we um, tend to use one hand more than the other. So we're right hand or left hand dominant. With our eyes, we tend to be left eye or right eye dominant as well. Why that's an issue is that say I'm right eye dominant, but I have my documents on my left hand side, my right eye is gonna wanna turn and focus on that document and my head's gonna crank and turn more. Same thing if I have two monitors, okay? And I'm say right eye dominant, but my second monitor I actually have on my left, I'm gonna crank my head more. Whereas if the monitors are slightly to my right, I have less head turn. Um, when I do assessments, it's amazing. We just slide the monitors a little bit one way or the other. I have patients look back and forth and next thing you know, their head barely moves, okay? So just to go through a little demo here, you guys can try this at home. Um, we're gonna show you how to find your dominant eye, okay? So what you're gonna do is you are going to take 
your both hands and make a little triangle like this to look through, okay? So little triangle like that. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn and I'm gonna pick an object in the distance, okay? Now ideally, it should be a good 10 to 15 feet away. You don't want something that's you know two feet in front of you. So I'm gonna look at that object, okay? With, through that circle with both eyes open. So you keep looking at it. You can blink a couple times to reset. Now what you're gonna do, keep looking at it. Now close one eye, okay? So when you close one eye, okay? Something's gonna happen. Either you're going to, that image is gonna stay dead in the circle or it's gonna move and you're gonna be looking at the side of your hand. Okay, so once again, arm straight out, looking through the circle, you pick the object. Okay, keep looking at it. Now you close one eye. Okay, open both again. Now close the other eye. Okay, so what happens there is the eye that is open, okay, that where the image stays, that's your dominant eye. Okay, so I'm right-handed, but I'm left eye dominant. So when I set up my second monitor or documents, I put them slightly to the left, which just keeps my head in a more neutral position. Okay, and so it's a neat little party trick as well, too. Dr. Andrew, we had a yep. question that uh, came up. Yep. And is it different if you wear protective lenses and look out the bottom of your glasses? Yes, absolutely. Actually, that's a very good question. So I'll definitely address that. So for people who have, yeah, progressive lenses or bifocals, um, the angle of view is different, especially looking at the screen. So that's one of the exceptions where that monitor typically is going to be lower. Okay, because if we typically put the monitor to, to the top third, people tend to be looking for the reading portion at the bottom of their glasses. And I, I'll see it when I do the assessment, then all of a sudden they're looking like this. Okay, so what you wanna do is you bring the monitor down to where you still feel like your head is fairly neutral. Okay, but you can see the screen well. Um, with progressive lenses, bifocals, yes, the monitor is typically, it depends, but roughly two to three inches uh, lower, so you're probably more looking at the bezel if you're looking straight ahead, or even an inch or two if you look straight ahead, inch or two below um, the height of the monitors where you should be at. Okay, but the easiest thing to do is to play around with that adjustment and just kind of feel your head, and you want to be in that kind of neutral position there. Okay, great. Uh, another clarifying question. So, if you're right eye dominant, you should be putting things to the left, opposite from the dominant side. No. So, if you are right eye dominant. Okay, um, so if I'm right eye dominant, if I have a document holder, so this is I'll probably flipped them when you guys are seeing me here, but this is my right eye. So I wanna have my documents or my secondary monitor to the right, because what happens is if it's on the left side, my head, my right eye is gonna wanna focus, which creates more head turn. So if I'm right eye dominant and I have on the right, it's gonna be much less head turn. Okay, so if you have two monitors, shift them slightly to the right if you're right eye dominant. If you have two monitors in your left, slightly to the left. Okay. Great. Any other questions, Frank, so far? I do. Uh, will you be talking about desks at all, like uh, in terms of recommendations for like online learning? I have a question that came up. We can hold it till later or? Um, that's, uh, we don't have anything directly addressing that, but. Um, so they're saying you are adjustable. Uh, if you adjust the height of your desk, is it good enough? Or um, are there desks that you would recommend for you know, kids working online? Essentially. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ideally, you know, in terms of desk, a couple of things, you want to have a, a nice clear workspace, desks that can adjust height. So you now have a lot of sit stand desks that are out there. Um, you know, Fellows makes a great brand, great one actually, I'm using it right now. But um, um, yeah, there's, there's tricks you can do. Uh, sometimes it, instead of, if they're on a decent desk, but you find that the, your child has to reach up, okay, because they're, they're shorter, if they're like say in elementary school, okay, then that's a question of you know, usually looking at a chair or some cushions to bring them up so that they're gonna be at a better height for, uh, for the desk itself. Um, so ideally getting a, you know, a, an adjustable desk is great, but they're honestly, they're, they tend not to be cheap. So uh, they're getting less expensive as they go along. Okay, but easier solutions are if the child uh, or the kid working from home is too tall, is bringing, it's easier to bring the monitor up and get a separate keyboard and mouse, okay? And if the child's too short, um, it's easier to look at a cushion or getting an adjustable chair that goes up or down, okay? Okay, I'm great, thank answer. you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, so um, this is just a quick kind of run through here of some of the key things. So if you tend to get 
Um, oh, actually, I just want to touch on this super quick for people who get headaches, okay, um, who get the headaches that where they feel pressure at the back of the skull or into the eye right here, okay, um, that you really want to watch your monitor height. Okay, because you have four muscles at the base of the skull called the suboccipital muscles that are involved with this chin tuck and a little bit of rotation, but this motion. So if you are down on the laptop like this, they're working, or you're upright and you're looking down, they're engaged. And why that's an issue is they tend to refer pain um, all the way along the temple, but then typically behind the eye and into the forehead. Okay, so for people, patients I get who say, oh, I get these, I get these headaches, they're awful, they're right behind my eye, I get all this pressure here. I know if I press on those muscles at the base of the skull, they're going to be really tight and tender. And lo and behold, we loosen those muscles up, they start feeling better. But if they go back to their home and they're back like this, it just keeps coming back. So that is directly related to your monitor height. Okay, so looking at the picture here, if you're getting a lot of neck issues, okay, or just top of the shoulders through here, or even into the arms there. Um, monitor height, number one, and then your keyboard position and mousing position. So your arm should be by your side and not reaching forward, okay? If you're getting a lot of low back ache, things you wanna be conscious of is trying to get yourself back and supported in your chair, okay? And having everything adapt so you can stay in that position ideally, okay? Getting up and moving more often. But the other thing too, is if your monitor's too low, you're gonna flex forward, okay? so getting that monitor up. Wrist pain, wrist neutral position, especially if you get tingling into the hands, okay? And leg fatigue, number one, get circulation going, get moving so that every 20 minutes take a 20 second break. But if your feet are dangling, get your foot up on something to keep your uh, legs supported there, okay? Dr. Andrew, I had a question, had a question that came sure. up about uh, the eye strain. So mm -hmm. basically uh, at the end of the day, um, the eye, the eyes get strained um, as a result of sensitivity to light. Is it because the light in the office or monitor is too bright? And do you recommend blue light glasses? Do they actually work? So, okay, a couple things with uh, that. So things to look at is, yeah, you can monitor brightness sometimes can be an issue where um, it's really shining bright in the eyes. A lot of time though too, um, especially with laptops, because we have them angled, you get the ambient light um, reflecting back as well too. You know, like watch, if I tilt my screen, you see I get this and this then is shining in my eyes as well. Um, so ambient light is one of the things you really wanna address, uh, especially for your laptop and you can move around a little bit. So you're not getting a lot of light reflecting off the screen on top of the light that's coming in your eyes. Okay, uh, number one, if you're finding uh, you know, when you first turn on the computer, especially if you get up in the morning, it's early in the morning, you turn the computer on, you look at the screen and you're like, whoa, turn the brightness down. Okay. In terms of blue light, okay, the blue light does cause a bit of strain in the eye, but the number one thing that blue light affects um, specifically is a hormone in our body called melatonin. So um, melatonin is the um, it's a, it's a hormone that basically gives us that sleepy sensation, okay? So end of the night when you're really tired and exhausted, your body um, ideally is producing a lot of melatonin, which basically wants you to, forces you to want to sleep, okay? The problem is, is that blue light specifically, light in general, but blue light specifically shining into our eyes and our retina drops that melatonin level down, okay? And so when your melatonin levels are down, um, you just don't feel tired. You're not as sleepy. Okay, so the problem with that is for people, I would say the blue light uh, glasses and blue light filters do work. If you have one on your phone, check newer phones, almost always have a blue light filter. So if you're, you find you're at home at night and you're having a hard time sleeping, but you're lying in bed looking at your phone all the time, besides the, just the mental stimulation, that blue light in the eyes is gonna drive that melatonin down. And even though you may be exhausted, you're not gonna have that sleep drive and that urge to sleep. So if you find, less about strain, but more you don't sleep well, um, or you spend a lot of time working on your computer in the evening, um, that's when blue light glasses or blue light filters on your screen make a difference. Great. And just for clarification, so should your um, exterior source of light uh, be behind you or in front of your monitors? Okay. So ideally, it should be um, almost directly above because if you have it in front of you it's going to shine that's another thing shining to your eyes uh too far back it's it's going to re reflect as well 
Um, and then that also plays with a lot of, just like I said, the angling of the monitor as well. Right. Ideally, that's one thing we, we didn't touch on. Ideally, uh, if you find you, you either on your laptop or your, you have a desktop computer and your monitor is angled back like that, that typically means you're looking down at it. So you want to bring the monitor up and flatten it, which will also decrease the amount of reflective glare. So okay. light on top or slightly behind. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Good. So now we're going to get to, um, this should work. This is a video we did with one of my student interns uh, showing you. So here we're going to show you how to set things up. Um, using both proper ergonomic equipment and everyday household items. So um, here we go. Okay, so we have my kinesiology student, Winnie, here. We lost the audio, Dr. Andrew. Okay, so there's a couple issues when you look at back. She's sitting. Um, yes, good. Her feet aren't touching the ground or dangling a little bit, which is going to lead to issues and potential issues with circulation over time. Okay. She's sitting back into the chair, which isn't too bad. But now you look at the angle of her arms here and she's reaching up and the wrists are bent a little bit. Okay. And then when we go from her eye level, going to the laptop, she should be looking straight ahead. She's looking down. Okay. So over time, she's going to pull herself forward and get into that hunched posture. Okay. So what tweaks can we make? First thing we want to do is to try to at least get her up in the chair so she doesn't have to reach up as much, okay? So using basic household items, we take a pillow, have her grab a seat, so let's do this. Okay, and you can see actually she's still not ideal. So let's try a second pillow. support through the chair back and now the feet are dangling quite a bit. Okay, so what's the next step? Let's support the feet. Okay, so you take a box, some books, something like that. Please, good. Okay, so now you look and her feet are supported, thighs basically parallel, that's looking better. Okay, and she's at a decent height here. Obviously not a lot of back support here, so what we're going to try is taking just a basic towel, rolling it up, okay, lumbar support above the belt line. Okay, so there, okay, okay, no worries, okay. That looks good there, that looks good. okay. How's that feeling? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay, so, and you look, the angle here is much, much better. Now, a couple issues though, this looks okay, but she's looking down even more now. So over time, she's gonna pull herself forward. So what's the next step? We wanna bring the monitor up, next step, so. We take standard paper. These are great ergonomic tools. Staple brand paper works very well. We put it up, put it up like this. Okay, so now uh, when you put your arm straight up, so we talked about that distance there, so that's a pretty good distance there. Okay, now we look, this is a much better type, but obviously if she's gonna type like this in this Frankenstein typing position, that's gonna lead to issues with the traps and levator and through the neck as well. Okay, so this is where you need to look at doing uh, some type of basic investment in a separate keyboard and mouse. Really simple. Okay, so we get a separate keyboard. Let's get you up on there. Okay, well, I might bring it forward just a little bit for you there. So that looks pretty good. Okay, this angle, not ideal, but still, that's pretty good. Now, we take the mouse. Boom. She's looking pretty good. Okay, so this is using, besides the keyboard and mouse, Using basic household items, we've made a lot of simple tweaks that are going to get her more comfortable and get her into a better posture and a better position. Okay. Now, if you have and you need to make some more significant investments or you're spending a lot of time, let's try some actual ergonomic products. Okay. So we're going to start with a laptop. Okay. So she's still slightly low with this. Okay. So we take this off. Take side. Okay, here, how a laptop riser works, pop it in like this. Boom, up like that. When I look 
She's hitting the top third of the monitor much better. Okay. What's nice with this one is it has a document folder in place like this, so you can actually have documents looking straight up like that. So once again, a lot less neck strain. The other thing I forgot to mention, if you're, we talked about looking at a lot of documents, so what you do is document folder like this. Once again, so less neck strain, she's not looking down as much. Okay, so that's a good setup there. Now let's look at some of the other products there, okay? So instead of that footrest, we can look at proper ergonomic footrest. What's nice about this one by Fellows is that it adjusts to different heights depending on leg length, height of the chair, okay? So we pop it down, back there. This, looking at that, should be a good height for me. And what's nice is because it flexes, she can pump her legs a bit, which will actually help with a bit of circulation as well. Okay, and that looks pretty good there. So now let's address the chair. First, this chair back. Okay, we look at something that's a little bit more ergonomic, okay, a little bit more like function design to work better. Okay, so something like this. Okay. Now, this one, this chair is ideally not high enough, but once again, we get a better support through here. This one can actually be strapped on and adjusted to stay tight to support her back. Okay. Ideally, with a slightly higher chair, this would come up and support her through the thoracic spine as well. But that's looking much better. Let's get your hands on the keyboard there. That looks pretty good. Now, the seat cushions, not ideal. So investing in an actual seat cushion here. My only concern is with just the one, it might be a little low. But let's try this and let's see. Okay. Bring that lumbar support up there. Okay. Let's scooch you in. Okay, so actually that's not looking too, too bad there. Okay, so we've gone from kind of a low end with using basic household items to using some more specific ergonomic products. And as you can see, when he's set up here pretty well, she's gonna be able to work more as long as she still takes those frequent breaks. Now what I wanna show you is how taking, using this product, we can adapt for someone who's my height. So Winnie, let's get you standing up. So you can see, Winnie's about five feet, I'm about six, seven, six, eight, okay? So it's a bit of a challenge to adapt things for me, okay? So let's see. So if I sit down, okay? So this is still low for me. I don't need a footrest whatsoever. So I'm gonna take that out, take this out. So my feet are flat on the floor. However, I'm actually low here. So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna get a separate pillow put this underneath this, you know, and this still for me, my height may not quite be enough, but let's see. Back. Okay, that's actually pretty good. Okay, lumbar support wise, what I want to try to do is sit back into the chair a bit. Okay, now I feel a little tighter, so I'm going to bring this forward a little bit here. I'm mousing here, okay. This still looks good. Now this is still low for me, but what's nice about this, Boom, I just popped it up, it's a little tight, so I push it back, bring that back, I'm looking here, that's looking pretty good, okay? Maybe a little bit of contact stress here, so what I would look at is something like this, just to take a little bit of pressure up there, I'm typing here, looking straight ahead, that looks pretty good. Okay, so we've gone from five feet to six foot eight and adapted things pretty well to fit me and I should be pretty comfortable working here. So as you can see, there's a lot of options for you using basic household items and using basic ergonomic products. Okay, and now we'll go to the Q&A. Okay, so there we go. So hopefully that gives you a few ideas of ways you can adapt things at home using basic household items. Um, it's not always ideal, but you can definitely get yourself in a better position. So thinking about being in that neutral, relaxed posture, getting back into the chair, getting your monitor up and taking breaks are essential. Um, so you, when you think about things, the neutral wrist monitor ups, your head is uh, not looking down so much. Okay. And 
like I said, key key thing is is take breaks. That's that's one of the main things you want to do is get into those uh, relaxed postures and take breaks, roughly every twenty minutes or so. Okay. So, um, Frank, I don't know if we have any more questions out there, but uh, I'd like to say thanks, everyone, for uh, listening today and joining in. Hopefully, you picked up some good tips and information. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Andrew. I appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to walk us through, um, you know, proper workspace and all the cool tips and tricks that we can do. I'm, I'm, I was adjusting my station as we went along, and I know I got some private messages as well as a lot of people are doing the same. So, some great tips that you can take back. So. Again, everyone, um, we're open for Q&A. So if you have any questions currently right now that you would like to drop into the chat or mute yourself and ask Dr. Andrew, uh, we greatly appreciate it. We also have um, Renee and Carrie on the line from Fellows who we carry out a long since line of ergonomic products at Staples and they'd be more than happy to answer any questions as well. John just mentioned that he just needs to keep on top of uh, hydration as well, I guess, throughout the day. It's an important aspect to uh, Good, healthy balance. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, like anything, we tend to sit and, you know, get caught up in our work and don't move and, you know, haven't had anything to drink or eat for some hours, which um, spe specifically with circulation, hydration is key. Excellent. I did have a question that came up. So in terms of, um, you know, when we put in some of these tips and tricks in place and we're still ex experiencing some, I guess, eye strain or fatigue, uh, when would you say is a, you know, the time to, to look into getting professional help? Um, typically I tell people like the body's pretty funny where, you know, you wake up one morning and your back is killing uh, and it's sore for a day or two. And then, you know, it sometimes goes away. But if you are, you know, sitting at, you have your workstation set up and, you know, within two hours of you being there, you always have the same specific ache and pain. Um, and then you've made some tweaks from the information we've given you, but it keeps coming back. Once you get, you know, a, a week or two in of having that same issue and, you know, you made, you've tried to make some adjustments, you've tried to stretch it out and move and it still bothers you. That's when you want to look at getting, uh, seeing, seeking some professional help. And uh, sometimes the body, you know, the body can adapt to a lot of issues, but sometimes you need that little bit of uh, extra support to make, you know, get, get you feeling better. Great. Thank you. So a lot of great uh, feedback. Everyone's saying thank you so much, Dr. Andrew, Nancy Williams, Joanne. They've had a great session. I do have a question regarding um, uh, yoga ball. Is it better to sit on instead of yeah. an ergo chair? Okay. Yeah, the yoga balls were hugely popular about maybe 10 years ago. They really became trendy. Um, and uh, the initially, so it's, and initially people are saying, oh, it's great. I don't have back pain anymore. But once it's typically like a lot, a lot of these things, new trends come out and it takes a bit of time for the research to catch up on it. Um, and if you think about it, when we talked about, uh, you know, neutral posture and having your back supported, um, when I'm sitting up in a chair, my, my, and you're, yes, you're engaging the core, but those muscles are engaged for, you know, if you're potentially for hours and eventually they'll fatigue. And the main thing that supports the joints and, you know, discs in, of your spine um, are your back muscles and your, your core muscles. So if they fatigue on you, it can lead to issues. Um, and what we know now is that in the studies they've done of people sitting on those balls, initially people feel better, but within two weeks or three weeks of doing it, this back pain comes back or it's a different type of back pain. Um, as a change, you know, to just change your posture and maybe engage the muscles for a little bit to change, fine. But sitting all day, uh, I don't recommend it. Yeah, great. I had another question regarding um, someone who's been using a vertical mouse for some time where my hand is in hand, the shake position. What is your opinion about these types of mouses? Okay, great. So vertical mice uh, tend to be great. So just so people have an idea here. So if you see my mouse is here, typically we're mousing like that. Okay, um, but that puts pressure on the carpal tunnel. And like we said, sometimes you can be extended or flexed. So what a vertical mouse does is it's more like yeah, a handshake or joystick position. So there's different angles. Some are like this, some are at about this angle here. And the theory is now you're moving like this. So you can keep that wrist in a neutral position and there's no contact stress on the median nerve. Um, for people who are, are having issues with specifically carpal tunnel or numbness and tingling in the hand, um, I, I usually recommend them actually. So good device. Great. Excellent. 